so it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Matthew Develbis from the University of Illinois at Chicago. Uh, he'll speak today about the generic differential equations are strongly minimal. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. Uh, yeah, so this is all um, joint work with my advisor, James Freitag. And yeah, so I'm a, I'm a model theorist, uh, but I've, I've been told to keep the model theory kind of uh, at a minimum. So we'll, we'll see how I did. <clears throat> all right. Um, so first, we're only going to think about ordinary differential equations, no, uh, no PDEs today. And then um, let u be a large differentially closed field of characteristic zero. When I summon solution sets and field extensions from the ether, implicitly these are coming from u. Um, and then if I don't specify otherwise, uh, f of x is always going to be a differential polynomial. And it's usually going to be defined over a differential field k. Um, and please, please stop me if you need me to clarify anything. I'm not quite sure how to look at the, the chat while the slides are up, so let me know if there's something you need to address. Okay, so let's get into uh, one half of, of the, the title. So a differential equation, uh, f of x equals zero, is strongly minimal if f is absolutely irreducible uh, when it's considered as a multivariate polynomial. So the x and its derivatives are each considered as separate uh, algebraic variables for that. Okay, And um, if we're given any a in, in u, that's a solution to f equals 0, and any differential field extension of the field of definition we have that the transcendence degree of the field extension with a thrown in uh, over, over the original field is either zero, meaning a was, was already in the field, or it's the order of f, which is as large as it could possibly be. So it, it cannot uh, realize any sort of intermediate transcendence. So this, is, uh, this notion comes from model theory, where it's used in a variety of contexts. This is just what it means in, in the context of uh, differential fields. Um, so in DCF0, which means the theory of differentially closed fields of characteristic 0, this was first studied intensely by Poisat. Um, OK. What happens, uh, what happens if f uh, is linear? Uh, I'll get to that in a second. That's a good question. Uh, that's, I, I believe that's the next slide. Um, a little bit more background. First, the, so this, is a, this notion is used in many contexts. I think maybe the, the most famous that I, that I could think of was uh, it, this is, it plays a central role in Khrushchevsky's proof of the Mann Mumford conjecture for function fields. Um, and even before model theorists sort of came up with this idea, it was studied using different language, classically by Pam a 100 years ago. Uh, OK, and then answering your question about linearity. So if we think of just let's pick a, an order to linear equation, say x prime minus x equals 0, and k is a differential field. If we take a constant, which is not already in k, so a constant meaning that the, the derivative of, of our solution a is, is 0, then if we adjoin, um, if we add a to k, then it has transcendence degree 1 over k, uh, because it satisfies a different, uh, in order one differential polynomial. Uh, but it wasn't in k to begin with. So this is not strongly minimal. In fact, uh, no linear differential equations of order at least two can be strongly minimal for this reason. You can always just do this, this kind of thing. Um, I guess I should point out that we're only going to be considering this property for uh, order two and greater. If, we, if you go back to the definition, order one equations, this 
just boils down to it being reducible as a differential polynomial. So we're only going to think about order two equations and higher. Um, so let's, why, why should people who aren't model theorists care about this property? So here's, here's maybe one avenue. Strong minimality is related to uh, integrability, or, or really it's related to not integrability. So here's a definition of Nishioka. Um, if A is differentially algebraic over a differential field K, we say that A is R reducible over K. If there is a finite chain of differential field extensions uh, starting at K and of length M, so that A is in, is in the last one, RM, and the transcendence degree of, of uh, one over the previous is bounded by R. Um, I had a cool picture that I was going to draw here of how this relates to, to other conditions, but I didn't have I didn't have time to finish drawing. So uh, let me just tell you what the picture would have said, which is that. Excuse me. Oh, Can you yes. say just one of the i or all of the i? Oh, for all i, for all i in the chain. All right. Thank you. Sorry. Um. Yes, so uh, there are lots of properties that one might want solutions to a differential equa uh, equation to possess, like being rational, i.e. It's, uh, it's a rational function over C, or algebraic, it's in the algebraic closure. Uh, it's an algebraic function over C, Louvillian, Fafi, and anything like that. And this is a weaker property, like even for, for R equals, or for, for any R greater than or equal to one, this is a weaker property than all of those things. And it follows from the definition that if uh, a differential polynomial that should be set equal to zero. Um, so if f of x equals zero is strongly minimal and has order h, then the generic solutions to f of x equals zero are not uh, h minus one reducible, which also means that they don't have any of these other nice properties. It can't be Fafian, rational algebraic, anything like that. So proving that. Um, so proving that a, an equation is strongly minimal tells you that its, it's generic uh, solutions can't have these nice properties. It also has a lot to say about transcendence. So just picking an example. Um, uh, yeah, proving strong minimality is often a stepping stone to classifying algebraic relations between solutions of the differential equation. So um, consider the order three differential equation satisfied by the J function, which I've, I've written out here, where R is, is some complicated rational function with a, a very large number in it that I didn't want to write down. Um, so it was proved by Freitag and Scanlon in 2018 that this differential equation is strongly minimal. Um, and this fact is, is used along with other model theoretic techniques to show that it's uh, geometrically trivial, meaning if you take solutions x1 through xn along with their derivatives, uh, and these are algebraically dependent over some differential field k, then actually there were two of them in particular so that two of them xi and xj, so that xi and xj along with all of their derivatives were already algebraic, algebraically dependent. So like- I, I guess real, slightly okay. stronger, uh, algebraically dependent over C even. Oh, really? Yeah, because uh, the, the equation itself is over the constants. And so- True. Yeah, so you will always witness relations over the, the complex number. Right, yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, so so I think uh, it, it, this is just one example. Also, uh, Rodney Daglu's work on the Pam Levay functions uh, also has to do with uh, uh, showing that that these equations are are uh, strongly minimal, and then using that to prove this this stronger classification of relations between solutions. Uh, so there there are two reasons why one might be interested in this property. Let me just talk a little bit more about what uh, things that have been shown to be strongly minimal. 
Uh, I'm, I alluded to this already, but there's Prashovsky's 1996 work around the Mordell Lang conjecture, um, where he proved that uh, Mannin kernels of non isotrivial simple abelian varieties are strongly minimal. Uh, and this used many model, theory, model theoretic techniques and a lot of algebraic geometry. Um, Nagu and Pillay, and I believe uh, 2014 used the results of the Japanese school to show the pan levé equations with generic coefficients are strongly minimal. Um, and their techniques are also very specific to the pan levé equations. Uh, another more recent example, Casale, Freitag, and Naglu in 2020 showed that equations satisfied by gamma automorphic functions on the upper half plane, uh, where gamma is a Fuchsian group of the first kind. These are also strongly minimal, and this uses differential Galois theory in analytic geometry. I believe, actually, after two slides from now, I will have listed all of the examples that are known entirely, uh, except for the, the original example of Poza and, and more recent work by Blasquez, Sanz, Casale, Freitag, and Naglu. Um, so there, there really aren't many, this is actually a very hard property to show, and there aren't many known examples. And all of these examples that I've mentioned use techniques which are very particular to the equations being studied. Um, there doesn't seem to be a, a general technique, a general differential algebraic technique for showing it. It always relies on, on other properties of the equation. Okay, so then one might wonder, we, we have these examples and they're pretty hard to show, but all of these examples that we've tried to show are strongly minimal, are indeed strongly minimal. So one might ask, uh, well, is this because these were already special and that's why we decided to study them in the first place? And, or is it because actually most, uh, most differential equations of this type are strongly minimal? And so this was conjectured back in 1980 by Poza that Generic differential equations are strongly minimal. Uh, what does generic mean? It can be interpreted a couple ways. So one might be interested in differential equations with uh, generic constant coefficients, where all of the coefficients in this polynomial, uh, in this differential polynomial, are constant, so the derivative is zero, but they're uh, algebraically independent over each other. Uh, another way to interpret this is you might be interested in uh, generic coefficients where each co where the coefficients are differentially independent. That is, uh, every single coefficient is differentially transcendental over the field generated by all of the other coefficients. Uh, the second one is the one that I'm going to be talking about and the one that I'm using in the in the title of this talk. Um, okay, and then, yeah, so, so here are the other, the other examples. So in, in 2019, uh, Joey showed that differential equations with generic constant coefficients um, of order two and degree at least three are strongly minimal. Moreover, that they're geometrically uh, trivial. And then uh, the theorem that I'll be talking about uh, if, if f is generic in the second sense where the, the constants are, or where the coefficients are differentially uh, independent and the degree is sufficiently large, then, then this equation is also strongly minimal. Okay. Uh, any so so what I'm going to do next is sort of talk about this uh, how we we proved this theorem and and implications that this proof might have. Does anybody have any questions before I move on? Yeah. So whenever means if, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So so if d is is greater than two times the order plus two, then this equation is strongly minimal. Um, I, I have a question about the R reducible, or right? You have a, you define a notion of R reducible earlier. Oh yeah, 
Um, is, is there a maximum R for any A? Would it be the order? No, R is just this chain, right? I mean, R is just the transcendent degree of the intermediate fields. Oh, uh, um, so I'm not sure. Maximum, or rather maximum M, sorry, I, I was, or fix R or, or something. I mean, what, what are the limitations on R? So, uh, um, yeah. oh. You got I don't know if it makes sense or not, but um, so when you say R here, do you mean the fields or the um, natural number? The natural number, right? R is just a number, is that right? Yeah, so that's going to be bounded always by the order of uh, okay. A, right? Okay. But M, I don't think so. I don't think this has been also looked at. So maybe there's a minimum or a maximum for M. I don't know. I mean, it, sure. I mean, what's the relation? Well, other than A is in our M, right? Um, can this chain be extended, for example? I don't know. Uh, I haven't. I haven't studied this this property very closely i was using it as an example but yeah okay all right thank you um may, may i ask ask a question so yes for, for the the theorem by remy jawi uh mm -hmm. it's of order of order exactly two in the second yes theorem, order yes exactly order exactly two. two and we don't know about higher orders correct yeah oh and okay. i, I okay. should have mentioned uh this this paper is on archive now but i believe uh, I checked his website and it's it's going to appear in algebra and, and number theory. Is that right? In in case you want to look Maybe. it up. Yeah, I think so. Ah, no, I, I can find it on his website. Okay. That's no problem. Yeah, I just wanted to check that. Okay. All right. Um, so before I go into the, the proof of, of our theorem, uh, I need to, to talk about the differential tangent space. So this is a notion. I think it's a notion of Colchin. I found it in Colchin's book. Um, the second book. So it's a differential analog to, to the, just the tangent space. And um, suppose you have a differential variety defined. Oh, I, I forgot to ask, can you guys see my cursor? Okay. Yes. yes. Uh, so you have a differential variety defined by some um, differential polynomial defined over K. And, and you have a, a solution you know, a, a point of this variety, and you take the differential tangent space over this point, denoted t to the, the delta uh, sub of the point, and you, you take, you add these, uh, you take these linearized variables, w1 through wn, and you take the formal partial derivatives of each of the derivatives of the variables. So you're, tr you're treating, um, the, the jth derivative of i as like a, as like an algebraic variable, we're forgetting that, that they're derivatives of each other. We're taking the formal partial derivative of that and plugging in um, the point to this partial derivative and, and multiplying that by, by our new variables, saying that equal to zero. So this, uh, this linearizes the, the space that we were thinking about, about before. So, uh, uh, Matthew, here x one are differential in the uh, variable, or yes, yes. Sorry. So g is a is a differential polynomial, and so x one through x n are differential variables. Yeah, um, and then here's a fact which can also be found in in Colchin's book, which is that the uh, the Colchin polynomial of the um, of x over k is, is the same as the Colchin polynomial of its differential tangent space over k uh, plus the, the point that the tangent space is over. Um, so I'll be using that. OK, so the setup um, for our proof, let f of x be a nonlinear differential polynomial of order at least one. And we'll use a bar to denote all of its coefficients. And, or alpha bar. 
and let alpha zero be differentially transcendental over the other coefficients. This is uh, this is important. It is very important that the the constant term be generic over the other coefficients for this to go through. Um, and what we're going to study is actually uh, the differential variety corresponding to f of x minus alpha zero equals zero. So we're just guaranteeing here that the the constant term uh, is a differential transcendental. And uh, a proposition that I'm actually going to go through a, a brief proof of, this differential variety has no uh, infinite proper subvarieties that are defined over uh, Q adjoint alpha bar and alpha zero. So the field of definition, uh, it doesn't have any proper infinite subvarieties. Uh, and Matthew, here the coefficients are not assumed to be generic or anything like that, right? That's correct. Yeah, alpha could be anything um, for, for this Wait, part. Um, sorry, yeah. Doesn't alpha, you said alpha zero is the constant term, so wouldn't it be part of alpha bar? No, no, no. I, I mean for uh, alpha bar to be all of the coefficients before we considered alpha zero. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, so so alpha zero is not contained in alpha, alpha bar. Uh, other questions? Yeah, so my, 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 my last question. So uh, this this proposition, isn't it a strong variety already or? Uh, no, I, that's a good question. So um, for strong minimality, uh, you need to show that basically this is true, except over arbitrary um, differential field extensions. And so what I'm considering in this ah, proposition is only the field ah. of definition. So this is kind of a weaker version. You'll first prove a weaker version and then, okay. Okay, good, yes. thank you. That, that makes, makes much more sense for me. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, yeah, so the reason I wanna go through the proof of this is because it's gonna use some very strange tricks that I'll need to reference later on. Uh, okay, so suppose towards a contradiction that, that V actually um, has an infinite proper sub variety W and it's defined by some differential polynomial g of x equals zero uh, with coefficients um, in, in the, the field of definition. So we can clear denominators and, um, you know, if alpha zero had occurred a denominator somewhere, we can clear denominators and rewrite g so that alpha zero uh, does not occur. In, in denominators, so we can think of it as more of a, a variable. Sorry, in, is this g the same as the other g or not? You have a single variable, differential variable x, or is x, uh, the x1 up to xn? Uh, this is the same g. Same g. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so, so what I want to do is take the same so polynomial. Why would you, oh, okay. All right. All right. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Um, so because this is a very strange trick, um, I'll do, I'll do my, my best with it. Uh, because alpha zero is a differential transcendental, what we're gonna do is replace alpha zero with a, a new variable y. Um, so, so we've cleared denominators and now we take every instance of alpha zero and we, we consider these new uh, differential varieties where alpha zero has been replaced with a variable. So now we have two differential variables, and um, showing that there's an infinite proper subvariety. Well, OK, we'll, we'll denote them v sub y and w sub y. And showing that v has an infinite proper subvariety, uh, sub differential variety, is equivalent to showing that, that wy um, has a, a non-constant Colchin polynomial, right? It has a, a infinite transcendence degree. So uh, over the field of definition. Um, uh, any questions about that? Okay. Um, so what we do next is so we're, we're assuming towards a contradiction that the WI actually has a, 
uh, an infinite Colchin polynomial. And now we're going to move to the differential tangent space. We're going we're to linearize this so that we can make sense of what these subarrays are. So let B be a generic point of WY um, over the field of definition. And using the fact from a few slides ago, and this, this isn't obvious, one needs to show that, that this B is, is also generic for enough for, for VY that this goes through. But it, it happens to be the case that the differential tangent space of, of WY is strictly contained in the differential tangent space of, of VY. And if VY was, is you know, the analog of our original variety. So if we write out what is this differential tangent space, um, it's, it's just a set of WZ satisfying this linear uh, differential equation. And Z is just set equal to this, this function, this linear function of W and its derivatives. Um, so Z is determined by our choice of W, but W is chosen freely. So by projecting away from Z, we get uh, a bijection to affine one space. Um, and uh, affine one space has no um, proper subspace uh, with an infinite Colchin polynomial. All of them have constant Colchin polynomials. And this bijection is going to preserve transcendence degree and Colchin polynomial and that kind of thing, which means that um, the differential tangent space of Vy couldn't have had a, uh, a non constant Colchin polynomial subspace to begin with. And since, and by the previous fact, uh, this differential, this differential tangent space has to have the same Colchin polynomial as WY, which we claimed previously had to have non-constant Colchin polynomial. And we've shown that it does have, have constant Colchin polynomial, so that gives us a contradiction. Um, it's a slightly strange proof, but I, I am going to use these constructions again, this, this trick where we take the differential transcendental that's in, in the constant section, that's what it's for, and we're going to replace it with y and then linearize the problem. Uh, but that's the end of this proposition. Does anybody have any questions? So okay. I, I wonder where exactly the line, uh, so, so your, your polynomial after the replacement of uh, the constant term of new variable, your polynomial mm -hmm. was a special form, f of x minus yes. y. Yes. Uh, where, exactly, where exactly this special form comes into play in the proof? Uh, well, it's, it's useful later on, um, but also in this part where I claimed that the tangent space of, of wy is contained in the tangent space of vy, that comes from the special form of VY. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, uh, so it's hidden here. Okay, good, yeah. good, thank you. Okay, so we've shown that um, strong minimality holds before we've considered differential extensions, but there's no obvious way to extend this strategy to arbitrary differential extensions. So here we use um, a surprising model theoretic principle called Shala reflection, controversially called Shala reflection. I don't know if, if that name has been settled on. But instead of, as in the, the definition of uh, strong minimality, instead of having to consider arbitrary differential field extensions, it actually suffices to only consider field extensions generated by finitely many solutions of our equation. And this is equivalent to understanding that the, the subvarieties of, of V to the M, um, meaning you know, M tuples of uh, solutions to V. Okay, so using this trick, um, we wanna now study the, the subvarieties of V to the M. So this is uh, for, for any natural number M, V to the M is, is M tuple, so each coordinate xi satisfies f of xi minus alpha zero equals zero, just the, the same as before. And we're going to do the same trick, but for each equation. So we're going to replace uh, all instances of alpha zero with a new variable y. 
And we're going to call the new space uh, VM sub Y. Uh, and, and so it's defined by this middle uh, uh, system of equations. And um, all of these functions are, are equal to the same Y. So it's actually possible for us to eliminate Y just to simplify things a little bit and without loss of generality, we can think of this same space as just being uh, cut out by this system of equations where we've just set f of x1 equal to all of the other, uh, all the other left-hand side. So this is what I'm going to mean when I say uh, v of m, vmy, I guess I'll say it. And now using Shalal reflection, um, and also a, a similar argument as the proposition that we just proved, we moved to the differential tangent space and we obtain um, this proposition. So if you can show that for all, um, all, for all natural numbers M and all M tuples of generic points, B1 through Bm of V, we're still talking about the same V, then, and we're trying to show that V is strongly minimal, then it suffices to check that the differential tangent space of VMY over this tuple of generic points has no uh, definable proper infinite rank subspaces over, um, over the field of definition uh, plus, plus this, this generic tuple. Um, so that gives us kind of a general strategy for trying to prove that V is strongly minimal. We have a problem, which is that uh, checking something like this for all M is hard. And uh, so recent work of Freitag and Musa on degree of non-minimality allows us to bound M. Uh, so in their paper from this year, in uh, the context of differentially closed fields, the, the non-minimality degree, I prefer to, to skip the definition for now, but it's bounded by uh, the U rank plus one, but the important bound is it's bounded by the order of our variety plus one. And it turns out that we only need to check M uh, bounded by the non-minimality degree plus one. So here is our... Um, here is that same proposition, but with this bound. So it suffices to just check um, uh, that proposition for M bounded by the order plus two. Um, so that's that's how many, that's the length of, of the tuples that we have to consider. And what I wanna point out is that we haven't assumed that V is generic yet. Um, what we really need, and there's no way around this, is that V has to have that differential transcendental in the constants position. Um, that is a, a fundamental part of this. So it's not completely general, but we haven't, we haven't required anything special of the other um, coefficients yet. So uh, it is in principle possible to take non-generic, and I'll talk about this more at the end, like after the intermission, um, but it's in principle possible to apply this theorem to non-generic equations. Okay, and then, uh, oh, the timing's perfect. This is my last slide before the intermission. So this just briefly summarizes how we get from that theorem to the main theorem about uh, generic differential equations. So there are two steps. First, um, if you let, uh, if you take f of x, now to be a fully generic differential equation um, of order h and degree d, and we need d to be at least 2m, where, where m is, is the, the same as before. And um, we have a, a generic, an m tuple of generic solutions b. Then if we look at this differential tangent space, which we have to, um, which we have to study, then it will have itself, it will itself have generic coefficients over the rationals. Um, and then the second step 
And this second bullet point is what I'm going to talk about after the break. So if you take the solution set of any system of generic linear equations like this, then it does not have any infinite rank subspaces. Um, this is harder to show, uh, but there you can, there's an algorithm that one can use to sort of reduce the orders that I'll be talking about later. And you form a bijection with affine one space, just like before. And since affine one space has no infinite rank subspaces, neither can this. Okay, and then putting that together with our last theorem, if we take a generic differential polynomial of order at least two in degree D, then this variety is strongly minimal uh, as long as D is at least two times the order of H plus three. Okay. Uh, any, any questions before we go to break? Maybe I have a short question. So uh, you, you, you have some uh, uh, degree bond in, in, in your theorems and that the degree uh, for your theorem to work, the degree should be at least two uh, times H plus two. Uh, yes. Is there known any de uh, degree not equal to one for which the statement is false? Like, is it known that for order three and degree five, uh, the generic equation is not strongly minimal? Oh, like uh, no, in fact, I personally suspect that you can get away with having the degree being very low. Um, but this uh -huh. is just okay. what was required to make the first bullet point happen. Yeah, yeah sure, sure, I, I understand. But so, so, but your, your feeling is that actually this degree bound can be lowered maybe up to two or something. Yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. Any other questions for Matthew? So to uh, um, replace what um, at the very beginning, for, so for linear uh, for linear equations, so how do you prove uh, non-strong minimality? This slide. Yeah. Um. Uh, in any so, if you have a linear differential equation of order, uh, at least two, then you should always be able to come up with a, a constant which satisfies the, which satisfies an equation, a linear equation of a strictly like smaller order. And you'll just take, take that as your example. The, the idea also is, um, this the solution set is a vector space and it's uh, and it's a vector space so you can look at subspace uh, of that vector space and that would give you uh, non strong minimality. Okay, thank you. I think William you had a question. I, I forgot. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, so let us uh, thank uh, Matthew for this part. I don't know what I want to ask, if you don't mind. Oh, um, okay, so hold on, yeah, go ahead, William. So in the degree bound, the, I'm just trying maybe to rephrase uh, Gleb's question, uh, degree D greater than two H plus two, um, is that best possible? No. No, okay. No, I, I suspect you can get degree, I, I think that you can get D as small as two, uh, just two. But um, yeah. so so if you can get it smaller, is that smaller one best possible? Oh, I'm not. I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. So so you don't have any counter example, in other words. No. We, in fact. I'll, I'll talk about this actually um, in, in a little bit, but it's really hard to come up with, to, to take any example and decide one way or the other. Ah, okay. So is it designable at all? I mean, other than, you, I mean, you, if you don't have this condition on the degree. 
Um, wh sorry, what was you? Is it decidable? Yeah, I mean, you just said that it's difficult to decide. So, so the obvious question is: Is it accurately decidable in in the algorithmic sense or something? Oh, um. That's an interesting question. Well, for example, um, for the second Penleve equation, um, when you witness that it's not strongly minimal, um, then it's an order two equation. The order one equation that witness that it's not strongly minimal, the degree of that is unbounded. So you couldn't just say you find a bound to, to uh, ah, all right. you see, so yeah. So and that's an example of, of how difficult that is. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that this would in generally be very hard. Uh, but what I'm going to talk about is using this theorem, summarizing the, the method that we developed to give at least a sufficient condition for strong minimality. Although if this fails, it doesn't mean that you're not strong and minimal. So I don't think that helps decide. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, great. So I'll stop the recording and then uh, we go to breakout rooms.